So, uh, what I'm going to talk today is about our use of C. elegans as a model to study uh, the microbiome, to study the factors that uh, shape the microbiome. Uh, this, of course, comes with the realization that um, most animals, if not all, are typically colonized by a, a diverse community of uh, microbes, most knowingly, most known is the bacterial microbiomes. Um, and those are important for different functions of these uh, organisms. So with that in mind, we were wondering what's the role, if C. elegans has one, uh, what, are, what is the role of those, those bacteria in C. elegans? And of course, we have had to, uh, to minimize a gap that was created over the years of uh, raising C. elegans on E. coli. The left here, you see an electron micrograph of, of the gut of a worm that has been raised on uh, E. coli. You can see these uh, circular patterns there that are ghost or cell wall leftovers of bacteria. But we know that uh, C. elegans is uh, normally growing, now we know, or we think we know, uh, on a rich uh, organic uh, material of rotten fruit or other uh, plant parts where you have uh, uh, rich microbial and bacterial communities. And the question is what happens, how do worms that are raised in these, such environments look like? And on the right hand side, you'd see the gut um, of uh, worms that are raised that were raised on composted soil um, soil simply with rotten organic matter and you can see that there are different um, looking uh, bacteria inside of that gut um, so it seems that uh, silicons does have some interactions uh, with bacteria the question is was which are those bacteria and what are those interactions now beyond learning more about c elegans uh, we believe that c elegans is really useful to study the, the microbiome because it offers this uh, uh, interesting and important advantage which is uh, that it is uh, clonal. It goes through self-fertilization and therefore uh, we can get populations that are genetically homogeneous and uh, kind of average out a lot of the uh, factors that are uh, causing a lot of inter-individual variation in other model organisms when you try to look at their microbiomes. So we're trying to take an, a, advantage of that. So the first step was, uh, of course, then to characterize the microbiomes. Uh, the way we approached that uh, was to generate uh, these microcosms of a uh, compost soil. And you can see them here in these images. We can have a lot of those. Um, and we can compost it with different uh, organic matters. So uh, we can sort of endorse different uh, microbial communities in the environment. Uh, in every one of those microcosms, we can seed it with uh, uh, initially germ-free L1 worms and let them grow to adulthood, harvest them from the soil and they characterize their, uh, clean them from the outside, uh, grind them and get the DNA from the bacteria on the inside and characterize uh, which bacteria are in the gut uh, by performing 16S uh, next generation uh, sequencing. And when we do that many times, we, and starting with uh, microcosm environments that are very distinct and you can see them represented, every microcosm is represented by a dot in this uh, principal coordinate analysis. The axis represents, tell you how many, uh, how much of the variation, the overall data is explained by every one of those axes. So you can see that uh, soil microbiomes, each represented by a different spot, dot, uh, fill in this uh, three-dimensional cubic uh, region, uh, while the warm microbiota that are raised in these soils, and we have uh, several replicates for each of uh, for each uh, particular uh, soil microcosm, so independent experiments. So the, the, the worm microbiomes in, in black uh, dots are kind of uh, filling a more restricted part of this uh, three-dimensional space that actually seems to be representing more of a plane. So it seems like the microbiomes of the worms um, are distinct from those in the environment and they kind of cluster together suggesting that there's some sort of a characteristic uh, gut microbiome with a characteristic uh, composition. So with that in mind, we looked for the bacteria that are uh, enriched in, inside the warm gut uh, compared to their environments that are distinguishing between those two uh, environments. And we could uh, zero on um, nine bacterial families that we uh, determined uh, should be called uh, considered as the core gut uh, microbiome. Um, and uh, in here you can see the, those families and their uh, relative abundance uh, in worms and in different experiments. In every one of them, uh, you start with a different microbial environment and still you get 
similar gut microbiomes enriched, particularly with Enterobacteriaceae and Pseudomonadaceae. Um, now, this is what we found with, uh, in our experiments of my, uh, using microcosm uh, environment uh, in the US. Others have, done, have performed similar experiments, and particularly Henrik Schulenberg from Kiel and Buck Samuel from Baylor College, that looked at uh, microbiomes in, in, in worms uh, isolated from the wild uh, as well as in their environments. And we pulled together <clears throat> our data together with their data and tried to see if there's um, how do our defined microbiomes compared to though theirs. And as you can see again, in th this time it's two dimensional, but it's the same idea of principal coordinate analysis. You can see that the warm microbiota represented by filled uh, 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 forms or shapes are uh, clustered all together. And these are microbiomes that have been characterizing worms from France, Germany, and those microcosms from California. So they're all clustering tightly together and pretty much away from the uh, dots that represent their environments uh, here in, 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 in empty um, shapes. So, and, and this is uh, from different environments. So you can see this um, diversity of uh, microbiomes in the environment, and then the warm microbiomes in, raised in the same environments, the respective environments are clustered all together. So we think that there is a characteristic uh, gut uh, microbiome. Um, and, and we think that uh, it is uh, a characteristic and similar in worms raised in different environments and in different uh, continents. Now, what determines this characteristic gut microbiome is, is the obvious next question. We try to approach that by looking, by raising um, um, worms, uh, C. elegans, uh, several strains of C. elegans, as well as uh, uh, related species, including C. briggsi, Ramenae, and a few others in the same um, soil microcosm or compost microcosm. You can think about it as a common garden experiment. We did uh, two of those and uh, we try, and then we, for each of those microbiome, we can see them here as represented as a dot with uh, different colors representing the different uh, strains and uh, species of uh, Sanorabiditis. And you can see that, first of all, again, as before the warm microbiomes, are clustered away from the soil microbiome. And every one of the species, the microbiomes of every one of the species, and we're talking about independent experiments, uh, are clustered more closely together than to other uh, species. Uh, and this altogether suggests that uh, genetic factors or the host genetics of the different species and strains uh, does have a, an effect on the gut microbiome and determines to some extent what it's going to be. Now, because we did these common garden experiments in different environments um, and with different genetic backgrounds, of course, uh, we can actually quantify the importance of uh, uh, different factors, environmental factors and genetic factors for shaping the gut microbiome. We can actually put the numbers on that. And what we found in these experiments, the environment is really important, or you can think about it as the environmental availability of microbes is really important for uh, shaping the gut, determining what's going to be the composition of the gut microbiome. Um, this is 50%, but uh, host genetics uh, <clears throat> also has a significant contribution um, of 12% to the overall variation uh, uh, variation or variability in, this, uh, in the data. So 12%, and it was significant, uh, statistically significant contribution. But as I'll show you in a second, we believe that this is an underestimate, actually, of the extent of the genetic factors contribute to the uh, gut microbiome composition. And this is demonstrated by a follow-up functional evaluation that we did with bacteria. So uh, let me explain a little bit how we went about that. Uh, we, iso we, we, we realized that enterobacteria make uh, a significant part of the warm gut microbiome that seems to be uh, conserved, uh, geographically conserved. Uh, so we isolated uh, many different uh, bacteria from the warm gut that are part of this family. We can use selective media to, to do that. And many of them were uh, members of uh, a genus called Enterobacter, uh, species Enterobacter colicae was most uh, common. And uh, those bacteria turn out to have beneficial effects for the worms. Uh, they were um, many of them were accelerating worm development by a few hours at the very least. And uh, some of them, um, 
which was not a rare thing to find, were also providing protection from subsequent infection. So in these kind of experiments, we grow the worms throughout development, but four hours actually turned out to be enough. On the particular isolate, we got commensal, the enterobacter isolate, and then at L4, we ship them to a pathogen, and in this case, we use a pathogenic strain of Enterococcus uh, faecalis, and we look for, uh, and we follow their survival. And as you can see in this uh, graph, uh, worms that have been raised throughout development on the Enterobacter isolated from C. elegans uh, were providing protection from subsequent infection compared to worms that were raised only on E. coli. But surprisingly, the same uh, commensal that was protecting C. elegans was unable to protect uh, C. briggsi, although it was uh, equally capable of colonizing uh, the gut of uh, C. briggsi. So that suggested that uh, the commensal from C. elegans has a specific contribution to C. elegans, which was not uh, manifested in C. briggsi. So we, liked, we, we looked at some isolates that we isolated from C. briggsi, and we looked for some that are protective uh, to a lesser extent, but still protecting uh, C. briggsi from a subsequent infection. And again, uh, they were not providing that protection to uh, their non-cognate hosts, namely uh, C. elegans. So what we have here are members of the Enterobacteria of the Enterobacter species that by 16S sequencing would appear to be exactly the same. So we don't have any resolution that would tell us the difference between them, but they're different because some of them provide protection for their uh, host, uh, to, to the host, and, and, but they're not providing protection to the other host, suggesting that they are different. So we might have this Enterobacteria family members in all uh, worms, uh, but it might be comprised of different species, different strains that pro do different things. So we think that the contribution of these genetic factors uh, is more that we can see uh, with uh, sequence uh, analysis. So we think that there's more to it. So we have a characteristic gut microbiome in C. elegans. Whole genetics seems to shape uh, its composition uh, to a significant extent. Um, so what are the genes that are responsible, that are these genetic factors that shape the microbiome? So to get a, a, a list of candidates, uh, we performed a, an RNA-seq analysis looking at gene expression in worms that were raised on a complex uh, microbial communities um, in different configuration and comparing that to worms that have been raised on E. coli. And when we do that, and we, we did that in microcosm environments uh, where we can actually uh, autoclave the environment and add E. coli, so that would be our control in this case, so it's not differences. So we, we can compare apples to apples all the time. We can do that on plates um, and with some kind of uh, synthetic communities, and we reproducibly saw an, in, an upregulation of uh, genes associated with uh, defense responses, uh, responses to external stimulus um, in the molecular function associated with hydrolyzed activity, namely uh, genes that are associated with uh, immune responses. I should say that those complex microbiomes in most cases uh, are not pathogenic, so the worms that are raised on them have a normal lifespan as worms raised on E. coli. So they're not pathogenic yet, they are, up, they are upregulating uh, genes that are associated with the immune response. And when we looked at a subset of those genes and uh, the, the overlap between all the different uh, uh, comparison that we did, we found uh, uh, known faces, uh, targets of the P38 pathway, uh, this, the p-values for their enrichment compared to the rest of the genome, uh, the entire genome, DUF16 targets and uh, targets of the TGF-beta BMP uh, pathway, uh, namely the SMA pathway. So all these are known immune regulators or Im pathways that are involved in immune regulation and we find targets for them in, that are upregulated in uh, worms that are raised on complex microbiomes. So we wanted to test those candidates and to see how uh, they might affect microbiome composition. And uh, this is the experimental pipeline that we use for that purpose. Um, instead of doing experiments with microcosms, which are kind of complex, uh, you have a lot of diversity and some variability, uh, we use synthetic community of gut isolates, so these are all bacteria that, were, that can colonize uh, the worm gut, 30 of those, and they were representative of most core families, although not entirely. So this is not a representative uh, microbiome, it is a microbiome that provides some microbial diversity that is similar to what you normally find in the worm. 
Um, because we used a, a identified bacteria, we can actually interrogate the composition of the worm gut uh, microbiome by using a quantitative uh, PCR, uh, where we had uh, aerobacterial primers that allowed us to follow the, to actually quantify in absolute uh, a, a, a values the actual size of the microbiome, how many bacteria or the bacterial load in, in the worms. And we could use a, a, fa a family-specific taxa for several families, not all of them, Enterobacteria, Pseudomonadaci, Bacillaci, common uh, bacterial families in the worm gut. We could use specific primers to interrogate uh, the, the relative abundance of these uh, bacteria uh, as a, within the, the microbiome as a whole. And, and this, this is the kind of analysis that we, we did with that. Uh, you can see the mutants that we use for the different immune regulators. Here's DBL1, which is the ligand, uh, the ligand for the TGF beta pathway, uh, PMK tier 1 uh, of the P38 pathway, uh, DUF16, and one of its targets for uh, DUF16, obviously. And we have a few more here that I'm not going to uh, go into. Uh, importantly, we have as a positive control, we have TNT3 which is a mutant defective in grinding, which means that it would let in uh, more bacteria than uh, normal animals. And uh, this, this, uh, this is the measurements that we get from the aerobacterial, using the aerobacterial uh, primers, uh, amplifying the segment of the 16S uh, um, of all bacteria. Um, and this gives us an, an idea about the overall size of the microbiome. And uh, the, the most significant uh, uh, results we got with DBL1 mutants that show the threefold increase in the size, overall size or overall load of uh, bacterial load in the, in the gut. Um, you can also compare that to the mutants, uh, the TNT3 mutants that are also uh, showing a huge uh, expansion in the amount of bacteria that are found in the worm gut. Uh, but the difference between um, there is a difference between the, the positive control and the uh, DBL1 mutants, where the positive control shows overall uh, not, not uh, statistically significant, not st uh, significantly different um, microbiome composition. So the relative abundance of different microbial bacterial families has not changed in TNT3 compared to uh, wild type animals. And this is basically what we're expecting. The TNT3 just are incapable of grinding the bacteria. They let in uh, more bacteria, but those are, uh, at the end, kind of come up to the same typical composition that you'd find in worms. So the, there's no specific uh, contribution uh, effect on shaping the gut microbiome. On the other end, DBL1 mutants, they both show uh, an expansion in the, in the um, in the size of the microbiome, but also show a change in the relative in, in the composition of that microbiome, where the relative abundance of Enterobacteriaceae is uh, growing uh, on the expense of uh, other bacteria. Some of them we cannot quantify um, directly because we don't have the primer, so we kind of pull them all together as other bacteria. So we focused on this uh, DBL1. Uh, because it seems to be most uh, striking. And there are other results here that we're, uh, we're following up on, but let's talk about DBL1. So how specific is this effect of TGF beta signaling to the shaping? We see that if we remove the, the, the ligand, we get a larger microbiome and more enterobacteria there. Can other uh, bacterial family take advantage of this, uh, of this disruption? So this is what we uh, addressed in, in this experiment, where we have worms raised on the entire, to begin with, raised on the entire synthetic community. And these are wild type DBL1 mutants in the positive control. And you can see what we saw before, the size of the microbiome is larger in DBL1 mutants. Now we take a modified synthetic community where we remove all the Pseudomonas species, there are a few of those, and, and all the Enterobacteriaceae species, and there are a few of those. And now, uh, TNT3, then the positive control, can still show this uh, expanded size of the microbiome. Remember, it's just a non-specific inability to grind. So still more bacteria are getting in, other bacteria than these two families. But DBL1 mutants no longer show this uh, expansion in the size of the microbiome, which means that the disruption of TGF beta does not allow any bacteria to, to become more abundant. Because when you remove the Pseudomonas or Enterobacteria, other bacteria cannot do that. There are about uh, 15 other species that were not able to take advantage of this disruption. 
So now let's minute, let's uh, narrow it down furthermore. So now we put back the Pseudomonas dasi uh, bacteria into the synthetic community. We leave out only in the Enterobacteriaceae. Again, no expansion in the size of the microbiome, suggesting that only Enterobacteriaceae can take advantage of the DBL1 disruption. And then we keep most, some of the Enterobacteriaceae, and we just uh, leave out three uh, strains of Enterobacter that were part of the synthetic community. And again, no um, growth in the size of the microbiome. So now uh, it seems that only Enterobacter can take advantage of uh, DBL1 disruption. So now we design primers that are uh, assessing the, uh, the quantity of Enterobacter specifically in the synthetic community. We look at worms that were raised on the synth full synthetic community, DBL1 mutants, and uh, the Enterobacter primers allows us, allow us to see that uh, the, the full expansion could be accounted for by an expansion in Enterobacter alone. So it seems that there's a relatively high specificity of the TGF-beta uh, pathway to control uh, specific members of the Enterobacteriaceae family, family, namely the Enterobacter. And those are the ones that they are interacting with this uh, pathway. So the TGF-beta pathway, of course, uh, DBL1 is just the ligand. Um, let me just uh, introduce you to, to the, the rest of the pathway. Uh, the ligand binds to a uh, which is, by the way, expressed uh, typically by neurons in the hypodermis, is uh, binding a heterodimer receptor SMAS6 of DAF and DAF4 expressed in other tissues, including the intestine. Uh, the, this binding activates the receptor that modify, recruits and modify uh, transcriptional uh, modulators, SMAS2, 3, and 4, that then migrate to the nucleus, and together with co-activator, uh, can activate uh, gene expression. Um, it is responsible for regulating immune responses in both hypodermis and the intestine, but it's also extremely important for uh, developmental processes. It regulates body size uh, and male tail development, and body size, of course, is relevant for our experiments that are done with hermaphrodites. Um, and so, so we don't really know, we didn't really know at first uh, whether the contribution of the TGF-beta signaling to the microbiome is somehow downstream to effects on developmental process or immunity. So to try to discriminate between uh, those two pathways, uh, we looked at different mutants of the pathway. And I should say that uh, specifically with uh, regards to SMA9, it was shown to be very important for body size, but uh, it was, was not shown to be important for uh, immune responses of this pathway. So we have somewhere to discriminate between developmental processes and immune-related processes. So we used uh, the same um, <clears throat> measurements as we did before, quantitative PCR with aerobacterial primers to um, measure the total bacterial load in different mutants. And here is the uh, expansion that we see, or the bloom, we can call it in this point, that we see in DBL1 mutants. <clears throat> we have another way to follow the, this uh, enterobacter bloom because uh, we managed to also to uh, label this uh, enterobacter, one of our enterobacter cloacae, the same one that I showed you earlier is protective. Uh, now it expresses a uh, TD tomato, and we can follow its colonization in the worm gut uh, very easily. So this is uh, wild-type animals where you see a conspicuous uh, accumulation in the anterior gut. This is the head region here with an asterisk, and this is the form of the gut. And these are DBL1 mutants where you see this uh, um, enterobacter bloom. So we used uh, these two tools for uh, different mutants. Uh, here are the results for SMA6. The images did not come out that nice here, but you can see here with uh, the qPCR the, that we have the same, a similar expansion in the uh, size of the microbiome. Um, the same, even more, uh, more of a bloom we see with, uh, in SMA3 uh, mutants. Uh, but uh, with uh, SMA9 uh, mutants, uh, we don't see anything that is significantly different from what we see in wild type, suggesting that it is the uh, immune functions of this pathway that are important for controlling the enterobacter colonization rather than its developmental, the developmental contributions of this pathway. So this is uh, what we found with, with mutants. Uh, we see different mutants along the pathway that contribute, that indicate that uh, uh, this pathway controls enterobacter. We tried also uh, the reciprocal experiment where we have uh, overexpressors of DBL1. And, and what we saw there was uh, providing more nuanced understanding of how this pathway affects colonization. 
On the left hand side, you see the, this conspicuous uh, anterior intestinal colonization of uh, enterobacter in the worms of wild type. And in DBL1 overexpressing worms, uh, I hope you can appreciate that you don't see this accumulation in anterior gut. Uh, you do see bacteria in other parts of the intestine, but it seems that the, in, in, particularly in the anterior gut, something is different. And this suggested to us that while the intestinal uh, cylinder uh, may be con you know, considered something very simple without any differentiation along the axis, it seems that the contribution of the TGF beta pathway to controlling the abundance of uh, um, enterobacter commensals is uh, particularly exerted in the anterior part of the intestine. So suggesting that there might be some kind of functional um, uh, differentiation of this uh, of the intestine in spite of its very small size, you know, 20 cells, nothing more. So we think that TGF beta exerts its control there in the anterior uh, gut. So where is it functioning from? I, I mentioned that uh, both the ligand and the receptors are expressed in different tissues. So the simple hypothesis was that uh, DBL1 is secreted from um, some tissues, uh, neurons or epidermis, functions on the TGF beta receptor in the intestine, and that affects uh, immune gene expression and affects the gut microbiome. But that turns out to be not so simple. This is, by the way, the quantification of the signal in the anterior part of the intestine. The, 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 what we found was not as simple as our initial hypothesis. Uh, we used um, the same assay of colonization with a fluorescently labeled enterobacter, and this is the, what we see here, the average uh, signal intensity. And uh, we compared uh, worms that were a wild type and worms that were mutant for the smart free mediator, and you can see this typical uh, growth in uh, abundant bloom in enterobacter. And we can rescue that uh, phenotype by expressing um, smart free from its endogenous uh, promoter, so it goes back to the wild type level. So we expect it to be able to achieve a similar rescue with intestinal um, expression of uh, smart free. But that turned out to be completely wrong. As you can see here, the uh, colonization of uh, worms that are expressing smart free only in the intestine was quite similar to the to the uh, uh, Enterobacter gloom, bloom seen in, seen in uh, uh, SMOT3 mutants. On the other hand, uh, the expression of the SMOT3 SMOT in the uh, epidermis seems to be very effective in uh, preventing uh, this uh, bloom, not to the extent of wild type, uh, but to a significant extent. And pharyngeal expression of SMOT3 was also pretty effective, um, less so. So it seems like we have a multi tissue uh, contributions of the TGF pathway to the colonization of the worm gut. And it's not direct. It's not uh, due to uh, TGF beta signaling in the gut itself. So a little bit more of a complicated story, but uh, we have a multi-tissue contribution to that. So there are missing parts and we'll get to that in my summary in a second. But before that, um, it's important to think about the functional con uh, consequences of this, uh, the, the bloom that we see in uh, mutants. So to remind you, uh, these uh, enterobacter uh, commensals are protective uh, from subsequent infection. Um, but when you have this uh, enterobacter bloom in DBL1 mutants, uh, you have more of those bacteria, but now they're exacerbating the pathogenicity of uh, the pathogen. And this is seen uh, much more clearly with a, a smart free mutants of different uh, uh, alleles. Uh, they become much more uh, uh, susceptible to infection and in the cadavers that you'd find in these uh, on these plates uh, uh, you'd find a very clear a very strong uh, colonization by the commensal suggesting that what used to be a beneficial commensal now becomes uh, contributing to pathogenicity instead so you can think about it also if you want to think about general terms of microbiome you can think about it as a dysbiosis where you have imbalance in the composition of the microbiome in here, it's an abundance or a bloom of enterobacter, and that leads to, uh, uh, to pathogenicity. So to summarize that, uh, we, we found that uh, the TGF beta pathway, uh, in an indirect way, uh, through si some, some, some signal X, uh, controls the 
colonization of uh, the worm gut by different comment cells, particularly affecting the uh, colonization by enterobacter comment cells. And when that happens, then the, the comment cells can be, in fact, uh, beneficial and protective from subsequent infection. But when you disrupt it, uh, you get overproliferation or over uh, colonization of uh, these bacteria, and uh, you get uh, now pathogenicity. We don't know yet what this signal X, but of that, of course, is, uh, is an uh, obvious uh, next uh, uh, subject, ne next subject, a topic of, of research. Now, if I will switch to uh, another way, in, in, in a little, to another topic in, in, in some way, is what happens to all this colonization uh, when you look at worms as they age? And we expect aging to affect the gut microbiome as it affects all other tissues. What does it do to the microbiome? And, and this is tricky to approach in vertebrate models, and perhaps we were hoping we can um, shine some light on it by, looking, by using C. elegans. So on the left here, you see uh, worms that have been raised on the same enterobacter fluorescently labeled, and this is day two of adulthood. And I, I'm sure you can appreciate that as the worms age, you get uh, more and more colonization. And you can quantify that. This is a day two of adulthood, and this is now also looking at DBL1 mutants. So we have uh, uh, the average intensity. This is the quantification of images just like this. Uh, you can see the over uh, proliferation of, uh, of, of bacteria in DBL1 mutants. But this is actually turns out to be uh, a normal part of aging, where you have this colonization and increased abundance of enterobacter. Uh, in aged uh, or middle-aged uh, worms in day five of adulthood in wild type. And as you can see on the right, um, DBL1 mutants, TGF beta mutants, also show this expansion, but they don't show more of it, right? So it's just the same expansion as you'd see during normal aging. So this the, the, the value here is average intensity. So this is actually considering the smaller size of uh, DBL1 uh, mutants. Um, so they just, they have uh, more bacteria in them, but not more than uh, wild type animals. It seems like the, whether they, they, you have DBL1 or you don't have DBL1 is no longer important. So we can look at it in a more complex context where we have this uh, enterobacteria mixed with other bacteria. So this is the context of the synthetic community. And in here we uh, did uh, colony forming, we counted for a colony forming units uh, per worm or bacteria per worm from the gut. And uh, we looked at uh, worms as they get to the to day nine of adulthood. And you can see in wild type that uh, the overall number of bacteria uh, in their gut uh, grows uh, with age. But as you can appreciate, and we use again the selective media for enterobacteria versus just uh, rich media for everything else, that the growth is specific to members of that family, enterobacteria. Other bacteria are not growing as much, other bacteria of other families. This is in, in, in orange here. So it's mostly the growth that is accompanying, accompanying aging is of enterobacteria. And again, you can see the DBL1, the disruption of TGF beta, no longer matters so much. So the, there are less CFU in, in, in those mutants, and you have to remember that DBL1 mutants are smaller. But overall, there's not more um, enterobacteria in these mutants, suggesting that DBL1 is no longer that central to determining the, the abundance of enterobacteria in the gut. So this is with synthetic community, and we can take it to the next level of complexities, the more natural-like uh, environments of microcosms, and uh, uh, we can grow the worms in those microcosm, uh, extract, uh, harvest them in different ages, and uh, then ask uh, how does the, their microbiome look like. In this case, we see there's bar graph. Every bar represents uh, one community. Uh, of, of a population, so it's average over a population. Every color represents a different bacterial family. Uh, these are two replicates of soil environments. Uh, these are uh, the soils in which the worms were raised. So we harvested the worms from the soil and the soil itself, perhaps to see if there's any changes in the soil as the worm grazing on them. Not something significant though. And uh, you can and, and I'm focus here, focusing, trying to focus your attention here on uh, this particular, this family of bacteria, which is the Enterobacteria. 
And you can see that from the larval stages of L3, L4, young adults through gravid and eventually to post gravid, so you can consider those as middle aged, aged uh, worms, you have uh, a similar growth in the abundance of uh, Enterobacteriaceae. So we see that also in the, um, the more natural context. And you can see that with the principal coordinate analysis that here is the soil samples and these are uh, the worm microbiomes uh, clustered uh, relatively together and as the worm go through larval stages become young adult gravid are shown here in blue and then the post gravid are kind of distinct uh, from the rest of the microbiome representing the change that the microbiome is undergoing we saw that it's a uh, part of that changes is uh, an increase in the abundance of enterobacteria. Uh, in this uh, figure where we see uh, the diversity, alpha diversity, or the overall microbial diversity of those community, we can see that uh, overall there's a slight decrease in the overall diversity of the microbiomes in the post-gravid uh, worms or in the aging uh, worms. So to summarize, um, we see that blooms of Enterobacteriaceae are part or, of normal aging. Uh, members, members of the Enterobacteriaceae family um, not only can uh, bloom, but they seem also to compete out other bacteria, reducing the overall diversity of those microbiomes. And we don't see any extension of, or expansion of this bloom in uh, aging animals that are disrupted for TGF beta signaling. And this is actually co coincidental with uh, a decrease in TGF beta SMA uh, signaling that others have shown. Um, there's a two-fold to four-fold decrease in the expression of uh, TGF beta genes uh, that has been shown by Gudowska in, 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 in a large microarray data set. Um, and more recent results from the Savage Dunn uh, lab has shown that uh, from L4 to young adult, there's a three-fold decrease in the output of uh, TGBF uh, beta signaling. So we believe uh, that this, the, the, the loss of effects of TGF beta uh, disruption uh, suggests that actually the normal um, expansion in enterobacteria in aging animals uh, is at least partially due to the decrease, the normal decrease in TGF beta signaling in aging animals. Um, and this is of course something that we are currently trying to, um, to to, to test. Uh, so with this, uh, I'll just thank all the people that contributed from their work uh, uh, to, to this project. Uh, JJ Naran, who um, labeled the Enterobacter species, uh, Stacy, uh, Dan, and Muriel who are currently analyzing the, the aging uh, worm uh, microbiome data. Uh, Maureen Berg, who started this uh, project back in 2014, I believe, David and uh, Jayun. Uh, worked on the uh, TGF beta uh, colonization and the effects of uh, different tissues. And Henrik, of course, and Buck for their uh, lovely collaboration. And I'm sure Adrian will have more to tell us uh, in the future about that. And uh, of course, for our funding uh, sources. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It was a very nice talk. Um, we can take a couple of questions now. Uh, there is already one from uh, Katie Savage-Dunn. Um, do you know what is the relevant source of DBL1 for this function? Does DBL1 expression change in different bacterial diet? No, I, I, I don't know. We try to uh, measure the expression of DBL1 uh, on different diets, but so far without uh, much uh, success. So we don't know yet. Yeah, but, that, but that's a good question. Um, uh, the, the, the problem with, with that might be also, though, that whether uh, DBL1 is uh, secreted in response to the external bacteria or the internal bacteria. So that's a big question, and, and, and it would be difficult to isolate the different contributions. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, Alejandra zarate Potes. Uh, do you know why the TGF beta disruption benefits enterobacteria acid growth and not other bacterial family? The, the short answer is no. Uh, the longer answer is that uh, the way we think about it is that different uh, immune modulators are responsible for uh, cocktails of antimicrobial peptides and, uh, um, and uh, enzymes. And then there are bacteria that are more susceptible to some of the components of those cocktails, right? So 
uh, just removing uh, some elements in that cocktail would provide benefit to some bacteria and would not be affecting at all other bacteria that still see the, you know, the elements in the cocktail from other immune modulators, for example. We have results from the P38 mutants suggesting that they affect other bacteria and not the Enterobacteriaceae. Uh, so they may be responsible for other elements that are, responsible, that are more affecting other bacteria. So I think, I think there's a modular function, modular structure here. Thank you. Uh, another question from Nicolas Lerba. Um, does the enterobacterial bloom in aged worm exacerbate or protect against pathogen killing? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we didn't do that yet, but definitely on the table. Yeah, good question. And then I have a question. The, did you try different synthetic community? Like, do you always see the bloom in, uh, in the enterobacter? So, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So, I, the way I, I think, I mean, we did uh, communities that didn't have the enterobacteria, and mm -hmm. then we didn't see any bloom, right? So, uh, it is only the enterobacteria that can take advantage of that. Now, whether we put the this enterobacteria in different with different bacteria, yeah, and to see whether right. competitive interactions, for mm -hmm. example, with other bacteria could prevent that from happening. Uh, we did try at least two different compositions of communities, and in all of them, in both of them, uh, we saw this enterobacter bloom. So it seems to be pretty independent. All right, thank you. Uh, and a question from Nick Vega: uh, There seems to be a lot of heterogeneity in colonization in the microscopy image. Can you say any more about the trends you observe beyond change in the mean of colonization intensity? Yeah, good question. And yes, we are not tackling yet this uh, variability. Uh, it exists. Um, it will require more single worm analysis in the genetic level and, and, and of the microbiome. And this is where you would get a lot of noise and we're still not sure how to tackle the single worm level. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think thank you sake of time we're going to stop here if you have uh, if anyone has any question left over feel free to ask them on the slack channel host microbiome uh, or um, virtual uh, worm session and we'll be happy to try to answer that uh, thank you everyone for attending today this went uh, smooth and uh, i will get in touch with everyone with the program for the upcoming weeks thank you very much thank you michael thank you anchor that was a great thank talk you. and uh, see you next week